I now call the last case on this morning's docket. That is case number 112925, Charles Dawson v. BNSF Railroad Company. Before we proceed with oral arguments, I was instructed by the clerk of the appellate courts that apparently the complication from this morning has been resolved and the person who filed the motion for admission pro hoc vice is now in the courtroom for our rule. Is that correct? That's correct. And I apologize for any inconvenience to the court. All right. Thank you. We may proceed with oral arguments. Your Honor, my name is Steve Groves, and I'm here for Charlie Dawson. We would, I would request eight minutes for rebuttal, please. Eight minutes is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. And for our 60-second factual synopsis of the case, this is a, there are four claims under the FELA, the Federal Employers Liability Act, by a conductor who worked at BNSF Railway for a long time. The first claim involves a cumulative trauma disorder claim to his spine. In other words, an injury happened over time while at work due to whole body vibration on engines. There are also three acute injuries that are pled, uh, two in March of 2008, one in January of 2009. Uh, in, in our client's lifetime, he had uh, several back injuries in the Army, previous back injury before going to work at the railroad or in the middle of his work at the railroad. In 2001, he developed back pain with no trigger. 2000, uh, no triggering event. In 2007, his back pain increased dramatically, and he had intermittent mild back pain chronically from 2001 through 2006 with no known triggering uh, cause of the back pain. Suit was filed uh, on this claim in February of 2011. The case was tried for 10 days to a jury. The jury reached a unanimous verdict. The jury was polled, so we know that. And the jury found that the uh, two back surgeries that had disabled him had caused, uh, I think it was around $800,000 in earnings loss for Mr. Dawson uh, and, and entered uh, pain and suffering damages for a total of $3.1 million. The jury made a specific finding, uh, the 12 jurors, uh, that the uh, injuries were timely filed. The um, Court of Appeals looked at the case, weighed the evidence, and determined that um, the injury for cumulative trauma disorder was not timely filed, and therefore also held that the timely filed uh, uh, claims were uh, for the traumatic injuries were also barred, even though they had been timely filed within the three-year statute of limitations. As this court is aware, part of the remedy in FELA cases is a jury trial uh, in almost every instance. It's part of what Congress intended injured railroad workers to have. And under the standard of review in Kansas, uh, the reviewing court must resolve all facts and inferences reasonably drawn in favor of the non-moving party, in this case, or the winning party, in this case, Dawson. The United States Supreme Court has, in numerous cases, and most of these are back in the 40s and 50s when there was a lot of hostility to the FELA and state courts. And if you look at uh, Gallick, if you look at Tenet, if you look at uh, Jensenowski, if you look at Lavender versus Kern, the United States Supreme Court has made it clear. If there are different inferences that can be drawn from undisputed facts, or if there are factual disputes, courts of appeals may not go back and look at the uh, evidence and reweigh that evidence because they think other inferences might be drawn, or they think that uh, what the jury did was unreasonable. And if you think about it, the Christensen case, which is the Court of Appeals case in Kansas, the only one that deals with the issue of uh, cumulative trauma statutes of limitation in the FELA context, 
if you think about it, what they said is right. What they said was, if you have actual knowledge, in other words, if the plaintiff says, I, I, I knew my back was injured, not that I had pain, I knew I had a back injury, or a doctor tells the person, you have a back injury, tells the plaintiff, you have a back injury, and that's more than three years from the date of the suit, the cumulative trauma suit is filed, that's actual knowledge. In this case, it's undisputed. Charlie Dawson did not have actual knowledge of it, that his injury was related to his work at the railroad until 2010 when he saw a doctor who said, you know what, I see a lot of people just like you who work at the railroad with back injuries. That's when he had actual knowledge. What, what about what the Court of Appeals did? They basically cited seven or eight different instances in which they inferred from the information given uh, to Mr. Dawson earlier than three years prior to the filing of the claim, uh, pretty convincing evidence that he knew or should have known that his back condition was caused by his work. Where, where did they go wrong there? And, just, and, and what they did from that was say, no, just as a matter of law, given these seven different facts, that's just enough. He can't overcome that. So first off, Your Honor, that's a very fair question. First off, they flipped the standard on its head. They looked only at the evidence that was against the verdict. What they were supposed to do, and they drew inferences in, in so doing. For instance, if you look in the Court of Appeals opinion, at one point, what they said was, um, Dawson argues, and this is quoting from the case, Dawson argues his pain was worsened after mowing, but even then, Dr. Wickham and Dawson uh, told her he had a rough riding train the prior Sunday. So we have evidence here that, that there was pain from riding on engines, and there's no doubt that evidence is in the case. He did have pain from time to time riding on engines. We also have evidence, and this is from Dr. Wickham's deposition, that mowing hurt his back. So what the Court of Appeals chose to do was say, we're going to specifically ignore the mowing evidence, and we're going to instead indulge on the inference that it was the uh, uh, riding on the engines that matters when they both matter. Because as Christensen points out, if there are different inferences that can be drawn, and by the way, Je your honors, what I'm talking about from uh, Dr. Wickham, this is from her deposition. This is not from her medical records. It's also in her records. But in her deposition at page 57, volume 35, what she testified to was that things at work and at home seem to make things worse and she never told him that either one was actually injuring his spine. So he told her things at work and things at home make his spine worse. Counsel. Yes, uh, Your Honor. Your reference to the deposition, um, I just want to be clear as we're going through this, that that's evidence admitted at trial. Yes, it was, Your Honor. Okay. And it was cited in our brief, pinpoint cited in our, in our, in our appellate brief as well. Yeah, that's a different question. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but there... In all my notes and going through this, I, I had confusion, frankly, with everybody about making sure that stuff was admitted into evidence and that everybody's only talk because this is a motion for judgment at the close of plaintiff's case, and so all we care about is what you did between opening statement and that motion. This was judge, and if you look at the at the if you look at the it's volume thirty five, and if you look at that volume, it's highlighted. And the plaintiffs are highlighted in, I think, green. One's in green and one's in orange, and I apologize. I can't remember which now, but they're, they're highlighted at the beginning. If it's highlighted, it came in, and it was read in during the case. Okay. Now, along, along those lines, the medical records that the Court of Appeals chose not to consider, those medical records were also introduced during the trial. Is, isn't that correct? They, they were. It was, and, and were they utilized then in your argument um, for directed verdict, I call it directed verdict because that's what I'm used to calling it, but were they utilized in those two subsequent motions, uh, either uh, post-verdict uh, and, pr and pre -verdict? I don't know that we actually attached them, but I'm certain that we referenced them because the information contained in those, uh, in, in those records was a big part. And if you look at the summary judgment motions, which are in the record and do have all those records attached, uh, we, we definitely were re referencing those. So the missing records that, that the Court of Appeals said that, that they, they did not consider were utilized at trial and somehow did not find their way on the record on appeal. Yes, and, and the defense and defense counsel wanted those records for the appeal as well. They refer no less than seven times to Plaintiff's Exhibit 463, which was all of the medical records. They referred to specific pages within that. We all thought they were in there. 
we made a specific request to have all of plaintiff's exhibits, including that exhibit, in the record. When did you find out they weren't there? Your Honor, it was three years ago, and I, I believe it was probably about a month. I'm not, I'm not certain. I know we, we filed a motion about a month before our brief was due asking the clerk and, and copy the court reporter to put them in there. We had written the brief. We had gone through. We had the records that we were going to cite. We knew, we knew what the records were. We knew what they said. We were getting ready to put the sites in very late in the process, in all candor, and we realized, oh my God, 463 is not in there. And at that point, we, you know, and when they filed their brief, to their credit, they didn't try to say that didn't happen at trial. They basically admitted, they said, we, we chose select portions of the record because they weren't trying to, everyone knew that record was admitted because it was. But well, you, you requested that, they, that it be a part of the record. We specifically filed right. with the district court, the clerk as were required, and copied um, the uh, uh, court reporter. We absolutely did. And that's attached to our petition for review. And I apologize, that the, I feel bad for the Court of Appeals that they weren't in there. I wish they were. Um, but there's no dispute about what we represent the facts say in our briefing. They, they don't dispute it. They, they say we're cherry picking, which of course we are, because we're picking the facts that show our, the, why, why the case should have been submitted to the jury. Um, and in this case, if you look at the other evidence uh, that was presented from, uh, if you think about the family doctor's deposition testimony, what does records show? 2001, he goes into his family doctor. He has low back pain, no triggering incident. That's what the testimony is. That's volume 34, page 9. 34, page 27. He comes in 2003, two years later, for a tick bite. He doesn't come in because he's having horrible back pain. He doesn't come in because he's, he comes in for a tick bite. Still some occasional back pain. On page 28 of that deposition, he comes in in March of 2005 for congestion. And he mentions I'm still having low back pain at that point. Um, in April 2005, he has diverticulitis and abdominal pain and low back pain. June, uh, and again, intermittent back pain. He was asked in his deposition at page 30, this is volume 34, would you agree, generally speaking, that what you see in your records from the first onset of complaint that seems to be chronic in 2001 through your visit in September 2006, as far as it relates to the low back, it seems to be more of an intermittent mild, somewhat chronic low back issue where he's getting some reasonable benefit from the medications you're prescribing? Answer, that seems to be the case. Interestingly, part of the claim in this uh, argument in this case is that Dawson failed to investigate whether or not his back injury was work-related. But if you look at the record, he asked or told each doctor, I'm having pain at some point, he told them. Uh, for Dr. Uh, Thompson, it wasn't until way late. I'm having pain uh, at work sometimes. Uh, and the doctors never told him that that is work-related. So he did tell his doctors that he was having pain. Not injury, and there's a difference. Because you could have a congenital back problem where you just have a bad back. And if you mow the lawn, it causes your back pain. Or if you try to mulch your backyard, it causes back pain. Or when you lie down to sleep, it causes back pain. Just because you have pain doesn't mean you have an injury. And in this case, um, no doctor, and in fact, told Dawson that he had a back uh, problem that was work-related until 2010. And Dr. Thompson, at his deposition, page 35, was specifically asked, the family doctor, if Dawson had asked him, did work cause my back problems, if Dawson had asked him directly, he would not have had an opinion in that regard. Well, what is the purpose of the discovery rule? Uh, to prevent stale claims and so that evidence isn't lost. Uh, and in this case, Your Honor, they, there, there's no evidence that there was any evidence that they couldn't bring or get. They're basically claiming that we filed this case six months too late because June of 2007 is when he had serious back pain for the first time in his life. Serious back pain. Different from the intermittent back pain he'd had before. He went to the chiropractor for that in June of 2007. Um, he also... Um, uh, and, and when he went to the chiropractor, and I think I pointed this out, at page 57, he told the chiropractor, things at work and things at home seemed to make things worse, and she was not telling him that either was damaging the spine. That's volume 35, page 57. Things at work and things at home, and this is in June of, of, of 2007. Let me just get, you're, you're running out of time, at least initially. Yes, sir. 
Does the discovery rule apply when the symptoms of an injury surface, er, like in this instance, surface earlier than three years, uh, but the negligence is still ongoing? There's, there, there's, a, there, there's a split. So there's, t- tell me your argument that, it, that uh, it is best for your position on that. Well, Your Honor, the FELA is a broad remedial statute that the court, uh, the United States Supreme Court has held must be construed liberally to effectuate its humanitarian purposes. And the FELA says every injury in, the, in, the, in Section 51, every injury is compensable. And if you uh, use a statute of limitations to toll an injury uh, in, the, in such a case like this, then you are holding not every injury is compensable. In fact, you are eliminating, you know, there's one, one set of cases that say that for any injury that's within the last three years when the case was filed is still valid. And there's another set that says that CTD claim is forever gone. And one more before you sit down. What do you mean by an acute injury? Is this, is this these, I, I know what you're referring to, three separate instances, instances yeah. but are they, are they a separate and distinct Injury, or there is it an exaggeration of his of his condition? What are they? both? It is a separate and distinct incident. Incident, okay. That leads to some addition, either a brand new injury or some additional injury or aggravation. The key is that it is a separate incident that happened that either makes things worse and aggravates it, or gives you a new injury. That is the acute injury, and in this case, what the court of appeals ruled essentially was. He had, he, his statute of limitations on his three acute injuries ran before they ever happened. Um, well, Your Honor, said, because it was a continuation of his initial conditions, basically. Right, which is with the, yes, sir. <coughs> uh, any, any other questions, Your Honors? One real quick one, I hope. Yes, sir. I, I thought I heard you mention a special uh, jury verdict form or question and that the jury returned a specific answer on when the knowledge of the claim accrued? They did. Can you be specific in what actually, what was on that form? What were they asked? Verdict form question one said, do you find, and I've got, I can get it, but it said, do do you find by preponderance of the evidence that plaintiff's cause of action accrued or his uh, plaintiff was aware of his cumulative trauma injuries? And by the way, judge, it specifically only referenced cumulative trauma injuries accrued less than three years before February 11th. So it was very specific. Yes. And they made a specific finding in that regard. Yes, they did. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Right, thank you. May, may I briefly conclude, Judge, just to say uh, we request that the Court of Appeals be reversed. Please the court. Mary Ann Ald for BNSF Railway Company. In answer to your question, I went ahead and pulled this. The verdict form says, do you find that the plaintiff knew or should have known of both the existence of his alleged cumulative trauma injury and its causal connection to his employment activities before February 22nd, 2008? And they answered no. So h- how does that interface with the standard of review where a district judge is not supposed to grant well again I'll call it directed verdict you know it's only supposed to grant that if no reasonable person could conclude that the plaintiff has established the elements of the claim this case never should have been submitted to the jury but we but it was and now we have a jury making a specific finding and and on appeal the Court of Appeals says no, no reasonable person could have found what the jury found. Correct. And that is correct. Because so, so not all, only did all of those jurors were unreasonable. With due respect to the members of the jury, yes. I think that they had information that they should not have had. There's information that was not properly um, explained to them. And this is the reason that even in an FELA case, when the evidence does not support the submission of the claim, it should not be submitted. There can be rulings, and there are regularly rulings, as a matter of law, 
even in FELA cases, even with the reduced causation standard that there is within the FELA. I apologize for my voice. My allergies up here are giving me a little bit of trouble. So um, if, if I need to speak up, please tell me and I'll try to make sure that I am heard. Let me go back a little bit and, and just talk first about what it is that BNSF would ask this court to do. BNSF requests that this court affirm the Court of Appeals judgment, which properly held that as a matter of law, Mr. Dawson's FELA claim was not timely filed. In analyzing Mr. Dawson's claims, the Court of Appeals properly applied settled FELA law and properly construed this record. Before we get into the substance of the law and the evidence, I'd like to address the discussion of Mr. Dawson's failure to follow the rules regarding citation of the record in the Court before, of Appeals. Before you do that, yes, sir. did the Court of Appeals reach its conclusion uh, based upon the absence of some of those medical records that they did not consider? I mean, no. I know it's hard to speculate what they would have done had they allowed those records in, <coughs> but it seems to me that that's part of well, answer that question. Do you think that's what they did? Well, what we would say is that, and I think that it bears out, if you look at what is actually in the record and what now has been demonstrated not to be actually in the record on appeal, it doesn't make a difference. Um, even if the evidence about which Mr. Dawson is complaining, um, if it had been part of the record and considered by the Court of Appeals, the analysis and the outcome of this case would be no different. It bears emphasizing on the front end of this that everything that's required to be in the record was Rule 3.02 says in a civil case we have to have the petition and the answer and all of these things, including the reporter's transcripts of proceedings. All of that is in the record. As this court knows, to the extent that the parties believe that there's additional information that would be helpful or that is necessary to the resolution of the issues, they can request that evidence be added. And the parties did that. BNSF asked for some things to be added. Mr. Dawson asked for some things to be added, and for some reason, things that Mr. Dawson asked to be added were not. The court reporter's failure to add that information, though, to add those requested records, has no impact on the Court of Appeals' substantive analysis of the timeliness issue, because everything in those records is merely duplicated material. It's contained in the testimony of the experts who were looking at those records, when they were deposed, if their video trans, uh, depositions were considered as part of the trial. So in other words, the information that did not make it into the official record is cumulative of the conclusive evidence in the record that establishes that more than three years before he filed this action, Mr. Dawson had sufficient knowledge, both of his injury and its potential cause, meaning its work relationship. So, because everything that the court needed was in the record, nothing would have made a difference, the Court of Appeals decision was proper. Before I move into the discussion of timeliness, I think that it's worth noting that several of Mr. Dawson's arguments that he makes in his briefing and supplemental briefing confuse the proper standard for timeliness and what evidence is relevant to that question. Mr. Dawson argues that facts existed as to whether his claim was timely. And in making that argument, he relies on such things as discussions of medical diagnoses or not, his subjective knowledge of his injury, his subjective knowledge about what caused it. The bottom line to all of that is that that really is irrelevant because the standard for whether a claim has been timely filed is objective. It focuses on whether Mr. Dawson knew or should have known two things. Number one, that he had an injury. And number two, that it was potentially work-related. And the evidence on those points was conclusive. So the Court of Appeals properly determined that under FELA, FELA law, Mr. Dawson's claim was untimely. Let's well, what, talk. what do you do with the as my colleague Justice Stegall pointed out, uh, with the jury verdict that didn't find that? Well, it has to be disregarded because it never should have been submitted. There was no competent evidence to support the submission of that given the test for whether the claim is timely. 
I'd, I'd like to start by talking about the cumulative trauma claim first so that we can kind of walk through that before we get to the allegations of some further acute injury. Excuse me, counsel. Yes. Your going through this is going to be responsive to Justice Rosen's question? Correct. All right. The Court of Appeals properly reasoned that Mr. Dawson's claim for cumulative trauma was untimely because the evidence established as a matter of law that he knew or should have known of his injury and its potential relationship to his work before February 22nd of 2008, which was three years before he filed his suit. The court properly analyzed the law on timeliness. As the Court of Appeals did previously in the Christensen case, the Court of Appeals here followed the Tenth Circuit's guidance on how to analyze timeliness for a cumulative injury in an FELA case. Importantly, the Court of Appeals recognized that the timeliness question under the FELA is different than the timeliness question under a traditional statute of limitations. Under the FELA, it is the plaintiff's affirmative duty to prove that the action was filed within three years from the date that it accrued. The Court of Appeals then applied the accepted standards for determining accrual, properly recognizing that the test for accrual of an alleged cumulative injury under the FELA is based on the discovery rule. We've talked about that. But here is where I think it's important to really make a point. This means, since we do use the discovery rule for a cumulative trauma claim under the FELA, that the statute, the time, begins to run from when a plaintiff knows or has reason to know of the existence or cause of the and cause of the injury that is the basis of his action. That's said in Christensen, it's said in Matson, it's said in Robinson, it's said in many, many, many cases across the country dealing with FELA claims. As the Court of Appeals recognized in Christensen, the standard is an objective one. It imposes on plaintiff an affirmative duty to exercise reasonable diligence and investigate the cause of the injury. So, so, so how, how does that work when, so, when someone has an injury and, the, and you go and get a diagnosis? It's up to the patient or the one seeking the diagnosis to, to ask what's causing this? Interestingly, there is no diagnosis needed because it's not about what the doctor tells the person to give him actual knowledge. That's why I'm no, saying it's, it's objective. It seems to be the Court of Appeal focused on Mr. Dawson's duty to inquire, to, to find out. It is Mr. Dawson's duty to inquire under the FELA, since the burden is on the plaintiff to timely bring the FELA claim within three years of the accrual. There is a burden placed upon the plaintiff to do an investigation when the information available to that plaintiff puts him on notice of a potential injury and its work relatedness. And that's what we have here. The evidence here is conclusive that Mr. Dawson knew he had a permanent progressive injury several years prior to 2008. Now, Mr. Groves has said that the Court of Appeals turned the standard on its head and focused on what supported BNSF. The reason for that, it, it's not turning the standard on its head at all. What the Court of Appeals did was say the evidence is conclusive, that he had enough in information, sufficient information, to put him on notice to make him do an investigation both of his injury, which is the first part of the discovery rule test, and of its potential relationship to his work. If you go through, and, and we've gone through a little of it, but in 2001, he began taking prescription medication for low back pain on a consistent basis. He continued taking that medication through February of 2008. In 2004 and 5, his physician, Dr. Thompson, diagnosed him with osteoarthritis with degenerative disc disease from L2 through L5. 2007, he visits an emergency room with severe low back pain. Later, he sees a chiropractor. Counsel? Yes, ma'am. Um, the two um, diagnoses you just mentioned are just, they're not, they're not caused by something, are they? They're, they're due to age and, and kind of just ordinary wear and tear, if we might call it that. Um, it, that, that is a possibility. It can be caused by something. It can be other factors. And here we're just talking about the injury itself. Is there some kind of an injury? And, and as you go through, if you're just talking about osteoarthritis, if we stopped there, I think disease. that might be one thing, but it doesn't stop there. It goes back through lumbar segmental dysfunction, 
a confirmation of degenerative disc disease, bulging discs, neuroforaminal stenosis, tears to the annulus fibrosis. If you go through the time, all of the different diagnoses. Get you past pain to injury. Get you really past pain to at least a duty to investigate. You know you have this injury. There is something that is putting you on notice. I have got a problem. Let me ask, and you, this. Let me ask you this. If it's an objective standard, and so, in, in answering that objective, figuring out the, the answer using an objective standard, you only have to look at a set of facts that the railroad comes in with and says this is conclusive. Whatever makes this a jury question? Well, when, it, would, when would it ever be uh, so mushy that it became a jury question? The main thing, if you're talking about injury, that's a little different than if you're talking about the work relationship. And I think that that is where the main complaint is. He definitely had something wrong with his back. And then I think Mr. Dawson has said, yes, but I associated it to all other things besides just work. Okay? So he knows he has a back ache, knows he has worse than that. He's been diagnosed with all of these different conditions and disorders. He's been getting epidural injections between July of 2007 and March of 2008. He goes to the doctor for back pain 24 times. Clearly, there's injury to the back. So then what about the work relationship? When he comes in and he says, well, but I thought it was something else. There's significant and conclusive evidence on that point here, too. You wouldn't have that in every case, but on this record, looking at the evidence in this case, we do have that conclusive evidence because you long have that before any back case, a, a, a back case that would proceed, wouldn't you? I mean, isn't this more than just this case in the sense of? Again, I think that it's when we're talking about the first part of the discovery will test the injury, maybe when you're talking about the second part, work relatedness, is there evidence? to put him on notice that work duties are causing this injury and pain. This case has conclusive evidence that may not exist in every one. That's why each case has to be analyzed on its own record. And what and is that keep... evidence here exactly? In... That's conclusive. Okay. Which you want is me not to answer a... that before? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, the evidence that's conclusive here, before one of Mr. Dawson's co-workers, Dennis Mush, retired in 2006, so we're a couple of years before mm -hmm. the accrual date began. Mr. Dawson had told him that he his work was related to his pain. He told him that he had pain related to toadstool seats and, quote, rough track. That's what Mr. Mush testified to. Did you say injury or pain? He said that he discussed his back pain with Mush and told him that his pain was related to toadstool seats and rough track. Pain. So we've gone through the pain analysis and the injury analysis. He's on notice that he's got this injury because he's going back to the doctor, back to the doctor, back to the doctor, and now he's telling a co-worker that it's related to rough track and toadstool seats. And then on June 5th of 2007, Mr. Dawson related to Dr. Wickham, who was his chiropractor, that, quote, nothing hurts his back but rough engines and track. In June of 2007, later that month, he relates to Dr. Wickham that his pain is worse from a rough riding engine. In July of 2007, he relates to his pain management specialist, Dr. Lair, that he had a rough ride on an engine and that sitting on engines made his pain worse. By that time, he was recognizing that every time he went to work, his back got sore. He felt These increased These are all related pain. to his symptoms of pain. Is it related to causation? Two different things, because yeah, we're talking here about accrual, right? And so, when we're talking about the accrual of the cause of action, this is putting him on notice that he needs to go and investigate this. He himself, in his mind, is associating all of the back trouble that he is having with his work. Maybe there's some other things that are also making him have back pain, whether it's mowing his lawn or doing those things. But that's not the test. He doesn't have to know definitely it's coming from work, uh, as the, Christensen and all of these other cases have said. On the legal test, with respect to the special jury question number one, which we talked about earlier, was the jury given an instruction on the law that applied to that question? 
I believe so. There are many instructions that and were do, given. Do you have any problem with the way the jury was get instructed on the law that applied to the first special jury question? I have problem with the fact that the question was submitted at all, no matter what instruction could have been given, because there was no evidence to support the submission of that, right. given the objective test. I understand that you're saying there was nothing disputed for the jury to decide. But I, I was just curious, since, since we're talking about all these facts, I'm again trying to figure out whether or not the jury, what did the jury do that was wrong? Is, is it that they just were unreasonable as we discussed earlier, or is it that somehow they were applying the wrong legal standard? I think that That's why I ask about the legal instruction. Thank you. I, I, I believe that when we give juries questions that should never go to them in the first place, we're going to get some ill-informed responses. And when the court submits questions to the jury, it suggests that it is a question on which there is evidence both ways. And so if they feel sympathy toward one party, if they, in their minds... Usually we say if juries were properly instructed on the law, we presume that they followed the law. But when the question never should have been submitted in the first place, that's almost to say that once it gets submitted, even if it was in error, then all bets are off and you can't touch it. And we know that's not true. Okay. If questions as a matter of law should not be submitted to the jury, no matter what they find, I mean, I'm sure that the court would have maybe liked to have been let off the hook. If they had come up with the, quote, right answer, then okay. But we can't say that just because a question is submitted, we have to take whatever the answer is. As a matter of law, it never should have been submitted in the first place because under this objective test, the discovery rule, he absolutely knew or should have known of the injury and its potential work relatedness. And that's all he had to have to start the accrual and it gives him time then to go get this investigated and answered. And reasonable minds could not have reached different conclusions based on that evidence. Reasonable minds could not when he was only put on notice that he needed to go and investigate. And he would have found, he ended up getting some people to say, yeah, there's a connection here. And so, in terms of the way that the evidence played out in this case and what he said and what the record said, not just his word, certainly he'll come back and say, well, I, in my mind, there could have been a lot of different things. That's okay. He himself objectively was drawing a connection by saying these things to a coworker and to the doctors and their offices that drew the connection between my back hurts and it hurts when I go to work. So, and so there's and, injury. And, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, I could, apologies. if I could follow up, I'm sorry. He was interrupting your question. I was interrupting his question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, look at the objective standard. Does that not mean that what a reasonable person would have determined looking at this information? A, an objective standard. It's not subjective, but what a reasonable person in his position would be, right? I believe that certainly when we use objective, it's saying it's not what is in his mind, it's what a reasonable person would have believed. And when that reasonable person is saying to my doctor, back hurts, hurts when I'm riding on these rough engines, this rough track, every time I go to work it hurts, a reasonable person would be drawing the connection between the pain that's sending him to the doctor in the first place and the it sounds like parts of the work that he's reasonable if he on notice and not reasonable if he isn't on notice. I mean, it sounds like you're using subjective belief on his part to demonstrate that the objective standard. I'm really not though. And I appreciate you saying that. What I'm really trying to communicate here is that based on what he said, nobody else made him say that. So he made these comments, they were written in the records, he but told the doctors what he, these things. What he's thinking and what's coming out of his mouth is his It suggests what where he is in this. A reasonable person would hear that a reasonable person who was experiencing that, that's reasonable to be connecting the pain and the work well, together. Know, that's a great closing argument you're given to the jury right there. What, and what prevents you, why shouldn't the jury consider that argument and consider other inferences based on the evidence? Because as a matter of law, the test 
shows that he knew or he should have known before that 2008 date that he had the injury and that it was connected with work. His investigation then would be going to the doctor and saying, I'm, my back's hurting, right? Correct. And then the doctor and, and then sometimes asking the right not. Question. I mean, not in not every case does someone ever get to the doctor, and the court still says that you are on notice because of the way that this played out. That's why it's so important to dig into the record in every one of these cases, because you can't say it's always going to play out the same way, and that certainly is true. Also, and I know my time is up, but with respect to the alleged acute injuries that he had. There was nothing about those acute injuries, that what he alleges are acute injuries, that was any different than the pain before the alleged first rough ride. This was a progression. Starting in that 2001 visit where he's taking medication for low back pain on a consistent basis, going through all of the diff different doctor visits, so he let... No, it's, it's your theory, though, that, that these acute injuries, that's how they've been labeled. That you can't recover, let's just call it in a broader way, an aggravation to uh, an injury that occurs prior to the statute of limitations? Not when it's a progression. It was not a separate, it was not an acute injury. And well, that then, is well, then what do, if, if this is a FELA case and there's some humanitarian aspects to FELA, what prevents the railroad from not addressing the negligence that perhaps caused the injury in the first place. If, if there's no right to recovery for continuing ongoing negligence that's causing these, these injuries, there's no incentive to do anything, is there? Well, but certainly a number of plaintiffs within the limitations period bring the claim against the railroad. Number one, I would say the railroad that I know and that I've represented for many years really okay. does value safety. Number two, if there's something that's wrong and a plaintiff does bring a claim within that window, they're going to try to address it. So, I mean, and so I'm, I guess no, I'm... No, but, but in theory, uh, Mr. your argument is Mr. Dawson should have known that his injury occurred prior to three years before this. And anything that occurs that may be a continuation of that, that is as a result of your client's negligence is non-compensable because it's a continuation of the injury. It was a progression of the same symptoms. And we can talk about the Henry case. We can talk about the Mix case. We can talk about the White case. They all say essentially the same thing. When you're talking about the progression of an injury, it's something that has been going on all along and has developed over this period of time. It's progressing. It may not have been as severe as it turns out to be in the beginning, but it progresses to something severe. You're put on notice and your cause of action accrues when you're on notice of the injury and its potential work relatedness. If you don't do something about that within that three year window, then you're bringing your claim too late. What Mr. Dawson is saying is that he had that cumulative trauma and then he had these acute injuries that were within the three-year window of when he sued. The problem with that is that he didn't have a separate, distinct injury. He certainly didn't prove a separate, distinct act of negligence on the part of the railroad, and that's what he would have to have to give life to any kind of a separate claim within the three-year window. How do we know that he didn't have a separate injury? How do we know it was just a progression of what came before? We know that because he had the rough ride on March 21st, I believe, two days before that. He had called the doctor to say, I need to come get another epidural injection because I've got this pain that's radiating, okay? So he calls the doctor and says, I've got this pain in my hip, my leg, my back. I need to come get another epidural injection. Two days later, he has this alleged rough ride. He goes to the doctor, he fills out a report for BNSF, neither in the report for BNSF nor in with the doctors that he saw after that did he tell them about his pre-existing back pain. Now this is a person that at this point has been to the doctor dozens of times for back pain, has all of these diagnoses, 
And there is, he doesn't tell the new set of doctors after the alleged rough ride of the pre-existing back pain. It's the same thing. It was a progression of that pain to the point that when they were deposed, the back surgeon, other doctors said, well, had I known that, it would have been different to me in terms of what caused this. Counsel, I think we understand your points. I'm going to ask if we have any further questions. You need 30 seconds to wrap up, or do you think you've established them? I'll always take 30 seconds if you give me 30 seconds to wrap up. At least let me say that what BNSF prays is that you affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals to the extent that um, this court for some reason does not affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals, BNSF respectfully requests that the court remand all other issues to the Court of Appeals for decision. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. You may. to the jury's special or verdict on that question referred to earlier? Your Honor, this is actually in response to the Justice's question about was there an instruction given to the jury explaining what the uh, uh, what was meant as far as statute of limitations or how that... On, on the law. Thank you. That's what I meant to say. So uh, this is in volume four of the transcript at page uh, 57. Instruction number 23. The plaintiff bears the burden to prove that his cumulative trauma cause of action was filed within three years from the day his cumulative trauma cause of action accrued. The plaintiff's cumulative trauma action accrued when he knew or should have known of both the existence of his injury and its causal connection to his employment activities. The plaintiff, the plaintiff has an affirmative duty to exercise reasonable diligence to investigate the cause of his injury. So the jury was instructed on the law and then made a specific finding as well uh, in their verdict form. And again, it was unanimous, and we know this because the jury was polled. Uh, there was a, a statement that was made earlier that we did not prove uh, separate negligence for the three uh, acute incidents. That's just, that's not correct. We had an expert witness, Alan Blackwell, who reviewed voluminous records of their track inspections, track repairs, who came into court and testified that the bottoming out incident that Dawson testified to, and by the way, his engineer also testified, they were going down the tracks and it literally, this is the first acute injury, which is unquestionably timely filed. They're going down the tracks and the engine goes boom, and literally bottoms out and the cow catcher, or the pilot on the front hits the rail. And the retained expert witness we hired said that that was, that shows you negligence and explained why. I don't want to go into all that detail, but he did. That shows there was not reasonable care being used for the tracks. It also shows that the tracks were not in compliance with FRA regulations that apply to railroads. Um, Mr. Charo, Art Charo, who was a very high up employee in BNSF's track department in Fort Worth, came in live and testified. He admitted that if the engine bottomed out, the cow catcher hits the tracks, as the engineer and conductor both described on the first acute incident, that that means the tracks were not in compliance with FRA regulations. So we have, and in an FLA case, if FRA regulations are violated, it's negligence per se. The jury never really reached the question of the acute injuries because they, weren't they instructed to first consider the cumulative nature of the injury and if they decided in your favor, they weren't? Uh, they, did reach, they did reach the acute ones as well, Your Honor. Okay. They, they, the, the jury's verdict was on all four counts. If you look at the, uh, the way the jury answered, they, they absolutely did. And if you look at the way the case was argued, if you read, the, you can tell. And if you look at the submission, the way the questions were, we actually, we had 15 different ways we were trying to figure out how to do this because we were submitting four separate counts. And originally we had them all set out separately and then it just the jury, the verdict form was super long. So we ended up doing was saying, first they got to find the statute on the cumulative claim. And if you look at it, it says, if you, if you don't find the statute was met, if Mr. Dawson didn't, file timely, then you go to the questions about the specific incidents. However, if you do find it, then you just look for the negligence. So. Yeah, I, I guess I misspoke. It was the Court of Appeals that didn't reach the 
the, the remaining three counts because they ruled the cumulative. They, they said once you have a cumulative count, those acute counts, right. they were dead before they ever could have been filed, um, which we believe is obviously not a, not a good thing. For we anyone. don't, as I understand it, we don't have a jury. We don't know whether the jury found that these were quote unquote new injuries. Well, I believe because we they know never that they, reached that right? under the FELA judge. I believe what we do have is if you look at the questions to the jury, the questions they answered were, uh, do you, was the defendant negligent and its negligence caused or contributed to cause plaintiff's injuries? Yes. Do you find they failed to comply with the locomotive or FRA regulations regarding uh, such non-compliance contributed to the cause? Question number seven. This is in volume four at page 62. Question number seven. Sorry. Do you find defendant failed to comply with one or more of the Federal Railroad Administration regulations with regard to one or more of the plaintiff's claims for March 21st, 2008, and such noncompliance caused or contributed to cause plaintiff's injury? And the jury said yes. Right, but but I don't think that answers my question. I apologize. I That's all right. Um, but it, it seems to me that because the jury found that the cause of action did not accrue until later, even for the cumulative injuries, there was no need. The jury didn't have to consider whether or not there was a quote unquote new injury. You're correct. So we have no factual finding in that regard with from the jury. I, th I think we do specifically question seven. Well, they, they found in your client's favor, they found there was negligence and damages, but, but that doesn't answer whether it was a new injury or uh, an accumulation of the old injury. Uh, a, a new injury or an aggravation, correct. Right. And, under, and whether it was a new or an aggravation doesn't matter. Because well, it, it, it may matter. It depends on what the law is, right? I understand yeah. your argument is it doesn't matter. Here's why, if I might. Because the FELA says the railroad is reliable for any injury that's caused in whole or in part, even in the slightest, by defendant's negligence. And what we know is they found that there was negligence, i.e. a regulation violation, that's negligence per se, and they found that it was a cause and whole or in part of his injury. So they did make a finding, at least as to the March 21st incident. Um, would it matter if the, uh, uh, if, you, if your honors reinstate the cumulative trauma? I suppose it wouldn't, it might be theoretical because if it's reinstated, it's reinstated. But they definitely made that finding, Judge. Um, Uh, Your Honor asked, uh, uh, Justice Rosen, I think you asked about the discovery rule, and I answered, actually, what's the purpose of a statute of limitations, as my co-counsel pointed out. The discovery rule under the Urey case, the purpose of the discovery rule is to make sure that folks who are injured on the job uh, have an opportunity to actually bring a claim, because you may be being exposed to, for instance, Urey with silica. In years of exposure to silicosis, you don't know it's hurting you, you don't know that it's causing an injury, you may... I guarantee you, if you're breathing silica all day, your lungs are going to hurt. You're going to have pain in them, but that doesn't mean you're being injured. You don't know it until one day you get diagnosed with silicosis, and the doctor tells you what you've got, and then you go from there. And it's the same thing with back injury. So the, the, the idea of the discovery rule is to make sure that, that people are able to bring claims um, because the FELA allows under URI for occupational as well as non-occupational claims. Um, one of the things that the railroad referred to was the fact that he had pain and he went to see his doctors. He did. And his understanding of what his doctors told him was his back was wore out. And that's what his testimony was. And I think, Your Honor, what you pointed out was um, that when you hear those terms, osteoarthritis, or you have those types of things in your back, a layperson doesn't say, aha, well, that means I'm, you know, that means it must be from work. You don't know. Because some people get it just because you get it. Um, some people do have it from cumulative trauma. And he did go to his doctors and he did investigate. Um, he, he went and asked them, none of them told him. Uh, and what his doctors did say, what he did tell them was, things at work and things at home hurt me. Sleeping, getting in and out of his car, yard work. Does that mean getting in and out of his car caused his back injury? Not necessarily, it probably didn't. Extension and rotation. And at the end of the day, Your Honor, we believe this case was properly submitted to the jury. We believe that uh, the Court of Appeals erred in, um, in finding that it's a matter of law that the case um, should not have been submitted to the jury. The jurors were reasonable people. The judge who denied directed verdict in JNOV was also reasonable. Uh, and if there are no further questions, we will respectfully request that this court 
reverse and remand, and also hear all the other issues that were briefed and rule on them as, as opposed to sending this back down to the Court of Appeals so we can have a resolution of this matter. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this afternoon. Court will take this matter under advisement. That